are going to uh, talk about uh, unstructured data. And as you can see from our little diagram there, in fact, Bill Inman uh, saw this the other day and he actually remarks, you know, that absolutely sums it up. So that's very good. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. So um, the subject today is obviously unlocking the value uh, within unstructured data using a product called Textual ETL. Now, uh, sorry, just on the introductions there. So uh, my name is Ian Nicholson, uh, Sales and Marketing Director of Data Transformed. I've got on the line as well uh, Dan Cox, who's our Chief Technical Officer. So I'll be just giving a few slides, a bit of an overview presentation. Dan will be giving the uh, deep dive technical uh, presentation. Textual ETL. So uh, I'll just do a quick introduction to uh, Data Transformed and what we do, and also to um, Forest Rim, the makers of Textual ETL, talk about why current approaches don't work and, and why uh, Textual ETL is quite different. So just as a quick intro to Data Transform, so you know, we're a team of BI and data warehousing experts using modern tools and techniques to deliver BI projects faster and main point at the fraction of the cost uh, and time of any other method. So uh, just doing a quick round table of our products. So uh, we're a Yellowfin partner for the front end BI. Uh, we, uh, we're a BI ready partner. So this is a product that builds data warehouses very, very quickly. Uh, Maxiplan for budgeting forecasting. We have QFire, which is quite an incredible data quality tool that puts the job of data quality back into the hands of the business. We're a partner of Actian, who uh, the VectorWise product has just literally been renamed to ParXL, but it's a super fast uh, analytical database engine that, uh, that performs about 100 times or more faster than uh, save and uh, some of the names mentioned there for uh, BI and data warehousing. And then, of course, we're coming to Textual ETL from Forest Rim Technology. So this is a product that can take information from any kind of data source and bring that into a standard database. Uh, we're actually, we found there's actually quite a good uh, synergy there between the QFire products, and I'll, I'll explain that a bit later on. Textual ETL is, uh, is created by Bill Inman, who is widely recognized as being the father of data warehousing. He's had over 50 books in print on the subject of data warehousing and unstructured data, thousands of uh, blogs and white papers. Uh, and he's actually got nine patents granted on this particular product. It's uh, actually a very uh, revolutionary product in what it does. Bit of background. So guys, you, you probably, maybe some of you are aware or not, you know, you've, there's lots of blurb going around the internet about big data and unstructured data. But the fact remains that 90% of the information that you hold within your business is unstructured, you know, and it's living in Word documents and PDFs and emails and even printed documents in filing cabinets. Okay, you've got a lot of data that is just simply locked away and hard to get at. And so, you know, being able to extract real meaning from everyday text has been a bit of a holy grail uh, in computing for some years now. And of course, for Bill Inman, and, and you know, when Bill finished his 50th odd book on, on data warehousing. Uh, you know, he's clearly defined his accomplishments there. You know, he set his sights on the analysis of unstructured data. So if you consider this little bit of text here, just a couple of paragraphs, uh, it's written in everyday English, and yet it contains a wealth of data. There's so much information locked away in there. And so imagine the power of being able to ask and, and query just that bit of text there, you know, with questions like, you know, what year was Nyad born? How old was she when her father died? You know, how long was she bedridden? All that information is in there and could be queryable if, if uh, we could somehow unlock it. But then imagine being able to extract and analyze similar information from thousands of documents, not just one. Perhaps more than, you know, a whole army of people could read in a year. It, it, you know, and that's the promise of Textual ETL. And this is, you know, the remarkable product that we're going to show you today. Unstructured data is not a new idea, right? It's nothing new, but there have been several methods attempted and they've had varying degrees of success. So the first one I'm going to talk about, and this is one that's probably most spoken about, and that's the idea of natural language processing. Now, Bill looked at natural language processing and determined it's not really going to work for several reasons. One is that most context within any text is not verbal. Because most meaning depends on emphasis. Funnily enough, Dan and I were going through uh, this PowerPoint before and, and uh, we were talking about that there's two words in there, drug and trial. Now, does that mean, is that to do with clinical drug trials or is that to do with a, a drug dealer going to court? So it's all about the context. NLP or natural language processing is very complex to process and it's not had a very good track record. 
The other option is to get numerous data scientists. You know, smart people are always an asset, but there's not enough to go around. So, you know, it's not a realistic answer. And yes, they can perform what we call textual disambiguation. We'll explain these these terms uh, as we go. But data scientists isn't a way either. MapReduce. Everyone's talking about MapReduce. You know, Hadoop, big data, MapReduce. Well, the problem with MapReduce is that you, you will need to write thousands of lines of code in order to do this. And this is like a kind of a, an enormous task, you know, because MapReduce is basically a throwback to assembler coding. And so no one's going to write all that code needed to do this kind of work in, in MapReduce. And then, of course, you've got the supercharged MapReduce products like the Hive, Pig, Mongo. But again, they're operating on the raw textual data, but there's no context in raw textual data. So there's only so much you can do. And then finally, there's search engines. So everyone knows what a search engine does. But the problem with search engines is that they are designed to find occurrences of data and kind of rank them, but they do not understand context. And it's only when you put context of text with your raw text that search engines become effective. So what we're saying is that context is the key word here. There's absolutely no getting around the fact that if you want to do analytical processing against unstructured data, you must have context. And as Bill says, context is essential to textual analytical processing as air is to life. And this is the big difference, and this is behind the patents behind Bill's products. What are we using this for? Let's take, you know, in the first instance, the example of, say, business contracts. So let's say we've got a room full of filing cabinets, and then there's a bazillion contracts, and we, we need to understand what information is in there. We want to be able to understand, you know, what, what are our liabilities? What contracts can be combined? Which ones are about to expire? What's their value? Bill has actually been trialing his products at the uh, Mayo Clinic in the US, and they found some amazing insights. What was interesting in that example was that not only did it highlight things that they didn't know, uh, for example, they found a link between people with liver cancer and experiencing long periods of thirst, but they also found out things that they already did know, which explains that the product does actually, you know, it's doing the right thing. It's actually finding things that, that, that do correlate. And then in, in the area of safety, Bill did a, a, a job at a, a, a large oil company that had actually unfortunately suffered a large accident the year before and, and a few people were killed at a refinery. And they were looking to see if they could prevent those kind of accidents ever happening again. And what they found was actually quite amazing. So they just read in a few years worth of accidents and incidents Everything from ranging from a, a truck hitting a car in the street to somebody getting a hand trapped in a machine and you know a valve leaking a certain quantity of fuel that had to be reported, and you know things started to pop up and they started to find that you know imagine a big oil refinery you know they 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 stretch over acres and acres of land and they've got thousands of pumps and valves and things everywhere pipes and what have you and um, they actually found there was a particular make and model of of, of a valve that would fail at certain times of the day early in the morning when it was cold. So they're able to correlate that stuff and they would never have discovered that just by having people reading all those reports. So this is the value of textually Bill. So Bill's process of uh, textual disambiguation, basically what the product does is take information from any source you like, whether it be email or text files or Word documents or PDFs, HTML websites, social media, you name it, and it brings it in. And then what it does, it applies a chosen list of taxonomies. Now, taxonomies means classifications of product. So a great example, if you go to the Amazon website and you look at the products that Amazon sells, they've got, say, like men's clothing, so you click down to shoes, and then in shoes you've got boots and sandals and uh, sneakers and what have you and then you've got different makes and sizes and what have you so they're taxonomies that whole classification and so for, for whatever industry you have there is actually a taxonomy industry list that will suit that and they're created by a company called wand and in fact wand created the taxonomy lists for for amazon as a, a bit of point of interest point being is to say for example you want to analyze financial data you can load up the financial taxonomy list and then you can run your unstructured data through, and the textual ETL product will find all those points of interest in there and put the findings into a standard database from which you can then query that with a standard BI tool. So if your interest is in, say, medical, same story. You can read in doctor's notes, patient records, 
whatever, pass it through the uh, taxonomy list for, for medical terms and do the same thing and and for safety and whatever, whatever it is you're, you're interested in, in learning about from your unstructured data. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, I'm just very quickly generalizing and glossing over that, but you'll, you'll see with the products, it's quite uh, sophisticated and, and can do a whole lot more. I won't do it on this list because uh, Dan will, but um, you know, these are the kind of processes that go on within the Textual ETL product. So there's quite a lot in there. So this is very much an out-of-the-box product. And in fact, the, the case with the oil company, Bill delivered that in five days. So in five days, they read in all of those uh, incident notes going back years, and they found all these uh, remarkable correlations that they never knew before. And as a result, they've been able to save millions of dollars potentially in damages and compensation claims and downtime and, and, and most importantly, life. This product is actually quite amazing and, and is, I think, one of the most significant steps that we will see in computing to come. So basically the benefits, you know, uh, you're getting your information out of your 90% of your unstructured data. You're able to discover insights that would have otherwise been impossible to achieve. Okay, and in, in doing so, you could save or make untold amounts of money, you know, in, in uh, opportunities and, you know, avoiding losses. The deployment time is very fast. As I said, five days for that the old company implementation. You're using everyday technologies that you probably already own. There's a wide range of taxonomies available uh, through ones. I think Dan's got some samples to show us today. And it's protected by nine patents. So you're not going to find this technology in any other product for quite some time to come. So now that's my bit over. I'm going to hand over to Dan now, who is going to give us his presentation. So just bear with me a second. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that uh, uh, waiting around for the, the change of ownership there. So uh, that was a great introduction that Ian put forward. Um, so I'm actually going to do a couple more slides and then jump right into the product and, and show you what it can do. So unstructured textual data, obviously, that is a massive, uh, uh, massive, massive undertaking. So unstructured textual data not only includes the data that we're going to do today but also includes all of the uh, buzzwords of big data but more importantly you don't necessarily need to go out and get your big data what more importantly you probably need to do is get the unstructured data that's already inside your company and that's probably where you're going to get more information and more uh, understanding of what your business is doing okay so just uh just really quickly about uh different types of unstructured data, obviously uh, Ian's touched on a little bit. So email, logbooks, uh, incident reports, contracts, letters, blogs, lease uh, agreements, you name it, websites. But more importantly, we now actually have to look at this in two different uh, buckets, repetitive type and non-repetitive type. So if we look at some of the repetitive types, so that, that might be contracts, lease agreements, log books, incident reports. That means that uh, you might have a boilerplate or a majority of the uh, commentary or verbiage in, the, in those uh, documents are repetitive. And there are only specific areas in there that you might want to pick up. So all of those um, uh, uh, mobile phone contracts that uh, uh, Virgin or Optus or Telstra have down, on the, down at each one of the uh, little uh, stalls and um, uh, outlets, retail, uh, those would be normally scanned in and, and left on a document management system. But we can go ahead and grab all of that information and pick it out. So on the other side, it's non-repetitive. So things like emails, letters, blogs, websites, every time an email is created, it's not used by boilerplate. If I email Ian this afternoon, it's gonna be different than what I wrote uh, tomorrow or wrote uh, the day before. When I write letters to different uh, companies or friends, et cetera, et cetera, I'm not using a boilerplate. There's going to be different things. So what that really comes down to is that there are different types of processing and different ways of pulling information based on those two different types of buckets of information. Okay, so <clears throat> Ian put this up before. So there are different types there. Now, this isn't uh, the extensive list of what's inside of uh, the textual ETL, but this is, are the main, main elements. So things like taxonomies, right? So that would be our different hierarchies, things that we can look up, uh, you know, city, state, country, continent, 
colors that roll into a particular color. And I will um, show you a little bit of, of the wand uh, taxonomies. They have over 50,000 taxonomies and they're all interlinked. So that's why when you go to, to Amazon and, and search boots, it not only comes up with shoes, but types and also then colors, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Homograph is actually something that um, Bill came across when he was at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, it has, happens to do with um, common acronyms or common words that are used in multiple situations to mean multiple different things. For instance, the uh, HA problem, uh, as uh, doctors will know about that, um, they might have a little script that they, they write down, and on there they might put HA. Well, that could be in some circumstances heart attacks, or in others, headaches, which are completely different and uh, severely different type of, of um, treatment. So with uh, homeograph, we can actually uh, break out the context of whether or not that should be a heart attack or a headache, which is extremely important, especially if you are in the medical industry or in the pharma industry or in the legal industry, that you need to take that shorthand and come up with the right association. Which brings me to the next one. So associated words, those might be things that you might want to uh, put together. So, so things like patio to deck, uh, insulation to roof. And again, this is the one uh, Ian mentioned before, drug and trial. Again, that is subjective as far as in what context as well. So if we were pulling a legal documents, that would probably be then, of course, a trial uh, for you know, a certain drug offense, whereas uh, clinical trials would mean, you know, maybe in a pharmaceutical industry where we've actually got trials going on, and so that would have completely different contexts. Associated blocks, where we want to start and stop uh, processing within a document, as well as um, picking up those special characters that can, uh, that can uh, uh, allow us to grab whole blocks of information. A name value processing, specific items that we want to actual, actually pull out, or raw data captured, pull everything or pull a particular uh, set of, of um, uh, strings together. Or proximity, so if I have the word hours, I want to look before or after that to pick up the actual number of hours, so 125 hours. So if I look for hours, I can pick up what's around at proximity. Or alternate spelling. Just like, um, you know, if we misspell a word, we can pick that up. And there are uh, already common misspellings within uh, the product. But not only just that, but even like the differences between American English and uh, Australian and, and um, the King's English. The, the, the word color or harbor is spelled differently. So we can actually put those in as alternate spellings or even actually alternate in, in the actual word. So raining to misting to pouring. Maybe we want to can pull those in all into raining, but just using alternate spelling. And stimming is the process of, of cutting back the word to its root. So the Latin most likely, so yelling to yell, days to day, and actually day goes back to uh, spelling of D-A-I actually. Uh, if anybody wanted to know that little tidbit. And of course, then different ways we can identify dates and numeric values. So those are the main ones. And we're only going to be able to touch on a couple of those today because there's just so much uh, to do with that and uh, being able to pull out so much type of information. So now I'm just going to jump in onto our server. And my connection got lost, so I'll just connect it back. There we go. Okay, so um, just before we get into the actual product, here's some um, uh, the very high level uh, taxonomy ca catalog from Wand, and um, and you can see there, there's every single industry that you can imagine. And that's just the high level. They have something like 25 million uh, entries. So they have uh, something like as well 57 or 67 different languages and conversions. So if you're in the pharma industry, 
they've got every variation of drug. If you're in the oil and gas, they've got every variation of part or manufacturing part for um, you know, an oil rig, etc. If you're in the auto industry, they have every single part that's been manufactured since 1948 or something like that. So uh, it's extremely extensive. Um, so what we're going to look to today at us, I thought we'd actually look at something that was relatively uh, interesting instead of looking at legal documents. Uh, so I've actually picked up a few of um, safety report accidents from the US, so the National Transport uh, Safety Board. And I've picked up two that we're gonna process today, one accident that happened in Washington DC and one that happens in Hawaii. And um, so if we look through this, we can see uh, that that um, we can find out different aspects of it. Uh, one of them might be the location, what type of aircraft um, we were, they were actually uh, flying, uh, the originating uh, airport to the destination airport, and also some information about the times uh, when they took off and when they had the accident, the last communication. Um, also, uh, we'll look at uh, some of the specific things around a pilot. So what were the pilot's um, uh, credentials, so pilot information, what their age was. Uh, we'll pull out um, some of the information like their their hours of accumulated uh, total flights, whether that was uh, night flying or ground um, instruction, flight instruction, as well as they always look at the last 90, 30 and, uh, days, as well as the last 24 hours and the associated hours respectively. So we'll actually pull that information out as well. So that's actually quite tricky to do, um, but with, uh, with um, any other textual type of ETL tool, the, the only thing that they can really do is pull individual words, but not actually give context to it. And that's what we're going to do today with Bill's um, um, Tool. So I'm just going to boot it up. So here we are, Force Room Technology, and bring it across. So on the left hand side, we, we have a fairly simple structure. We've got our document preparation, our document execution, some utilities, uh, indexing preparation, indexing execution, and our raw text capture. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually open up our utilities and set a path. Uh, for a single document right now. So we can just take a look at some of the different features. And of course, we can automate this and pull in thousands of documents at one time. So I'm just gonna add one document. And I'm gonna go ahead and pick up um, a PDF today. Okay, once I've set that uh, document, uh, the main screen here is how we want to execute it and what we want to execute. So I'll go to there, and there are three major areas. So again, uh, they would still fall into our repetitive versus non-repetitive, and our particular document here, uh, the two documents that we're going to be looking at, have a lot of repetitive text, but a lot of non-repetitive as well. And today we're just gonna focus on the repetitive bits and mainly focus on um, uh, the pilot information. So here we've got the ability to do some document factoring. So that would be things like our taxonomies, our stemming, our uh, identifiers as far as numeric and date uh, information. We also have the ability to do specific uh, date normalization. Obviously there's so many different ways to do dates there. Uh, we've already done, uh, Bill's already provided quite a few uh, standard ones, but we can create any sort of um, a format that we like and our name value processing. So this is uh, where we can really set aside literal terms and parameter type terms to pick information out. And of course, uh, uh, being an American product, um, they automatically have a few things like uh, the date field, which we'd have to uh, make sure that it's, it's not in that uh, month, day, year type format. Of course, uh, social security numbers don't exist in anywhere else in, in the world, uh, but we can set up um, formats for text file IDs, etc. And of course, telephone number that, that uh, would only be relevant for the US, okay? So one thing I might do is just set up, maybe looking at um, just going to do some uh, taxonomies for the, for the moment. And, um, and I'll just add in, we're going to do a description of just 
demo. We're going to look at, um, in this case, it's going to be a TXT type, but it's actually a PDF file. We want it to run as a document, and we're going to process it as a document. Now, of course, we did have different languages. Those are only uh, some of the default languages, um, but uh, Bill has quite a few other languages that uh, can be loaded in. So I'll go ahead and hit run. What this does is it's going to uh, set up a control file of things that now we're going to run. Okay, and um, if I go up to the document preparation now, I can take a look at multiple different things. So if I want to see maybe my taxonomies, okay, and uh, I didn't bring in all of the one uh, information because we'd have something like uh, 70, what was it, uh, 7.2 million uh, cities. I don't think we need to list all of those out. So I, I, I significantly cut it down. So here I've, I've brought in a, a few different airports that are more realistic for us to look at some of the cities, some of the continents, uh, well, actually all the continents since there's a very small number, and states. Obviously, this list would be extremely massive if we pulled in every auto part, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, but for today's demo, we'll keep it quite simple. Now, um, we can see here that uh, that we pulled those in uh, in an automated fashion from one, but we can also update them. So if I uh, and add one, I can take a look at uh, one of our PDFs and we can see here, um, I'll actually add in uh, one of the cities from, yes, from Hawaii. So that city doesn't actually exist in our taxonomy that I pulled in, so I can manually update if I don't like. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to add in what the category was. It was cities. I'm going to add in uh, hyena, and I'm going to tell it to add. So you can see we can uh, delete them as well. So if I go back to my taxonomy and just hit run, oops, I'll clear that and run. You can see there now it's actually brought it in. Okay, so it's not also it's not case sensitive. So I, since it actually put it in as as um, uh, a lower case, that's that's no problem. All right. So if I if I go now and decide to go ahead and do an execution of that, I can go to my document fracturing. Okay, so that's the type of process that I'm going to be running, and I'll just hit run, and it's actually reading that, and you can see uh, all the different bytes that it's actually running through. Okay and it'll take just a second to go through those taxonomies and while it runs okay and everything of course is held inside of a, a database in this case we're using sql server and it's going to write all those transactions that we're going to pull up into uh, the database so then we can pull it into our data warehouse and do analytics on them okay just about done And you can see there it's actually written 5,311 records. Okay. I can go ahead and, and view those if I want in here. But it might be a little bit easier to read it out of the database. Um, so we can actually see here that I've got some standard word processing. So it actually has uh, thousands of words that are standard, and it'll automatically run those standard words. Okay, Things like um, board, uh, Washington, okay. if I start to scroll down, accident, brief, uh, new, uh, number, those are elements that are actually uh, running uh, in a standard process. But if I go back to my utilities and decide to suppress those standard words, which I'll do because it'll make it a little bit easier for our demonstration today, I'll go ahead and click run and I'll go back to my document execution and just clear that and rerun it. Oop, I'll clear this one. That's it, and run it, and it'll be much quicker this time as well because it's not processing all of those standard. Okay, so now we can see it's actually run and picked up 13 records. So if I go back to uh, the display and hit run, we can see there the different taxonomies. So it's picked up an airport, picked up a city, picked up another city, an airport, et cetera, et cetera, another country. Okay, so if I wanted to take a look at that right out of the um, uh, right out of the table. I can go into the database for Forest Rim, and it's actually under the, the working file, working text file, and I've already got it open for us, so we'll just hit refresh, and we can see there uh, the information that's coming through. So the actual word that it's picked up from the taxonomy, OK, 
Okay, so you can see there that it's the type of taxonomy, and what the class is, so that's the actual taxonomy class. And very important as well is the actual character spot. So where Canada, in this case, actually starts. So the 20,697th character in the document is where Canada starts. So if we were starting to do uh, proximity, proximity uh, associations, then uh, we can pick that up as well. Okay. All right. So some of the other elements we can do in our uh, document preparation is maybe an alternate spelling. Okay, so if I go to my alternate spelling now, I can see that I have already put in uh, color to color. I've added raining to raining, uh, sorry, raining to pouring, and raining to sprinkling. So I can add another one if I if I like. And of course, um, once I start to build this information for a particular document, uh, then it can be ran multiple times and I can save those types of parameters. But because different documents do require some subjective uh, information about how to set them up, uh, we might have different parameters for different types of documents. So contracts or leases, uh, a medical profession, et cetera. So in this case, I might be looking for um, turbulence and I might, um, put that into weather. Okay, so I'll add that. Now if I go back to my alternate spelling, I'll run it again, we can see now that the turbulence is actually added in there as well. Okay, so then when I go back to my utilities, I can add in uh, alternative spelling for my document fracturing. I can go ahead and run that uh, again if I want, but I'll skip the uh, execution and I'll go in and do uh, maybe an alternative uh, timestamp. Okay, so when we looked at uh, our uh, information here today, we can look at uh, the time that they actually use inside of um, the NTSB document. So they actually use a, an hour, minute concatenation with a colon of seconds. Okay, so what we need to do is we can uh, set that up so whenever that particular format comes in, we know that it's going to be time. Okay, so I can come in, I can do my index preparation, and I want to do a, a new uh, document type. So I'm going to use um, uh, demo time, okay, and I need to add that. So that's going to give me um, an, a document type that I'm going to use to actually create my index execution, my index um, Oops, my custom format, there we go. Okay, so in this case, I wanna use that same document type. So this is gonna be demo time. I'm gonna call it now uh, the time, so I can have time minutes, time, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just leave it for time, and I'm gonna uh, just write in the actual um, string that I'm going to use, okay? There are multiple different ways I can use um, a, a builder to actually uh, create this uh, as well. So uh, there's a, a custom format where I can do piece by piece and walk through that as well. But since I know the exact format, I can go ahead and create that exact format, which I've just done, as you can see there. And I can say, um, display that string. And we can see that whenever uh, the numeric values four times in a row with a colon of two, two numbers after it, we'll pick it up and we'll associate time with that. Okay. So now I can go back into my utilities and under name value processing this time, I can add in my custom indices. Okay, so I've created that custom indice and I just need to tell it that I'm going to create now a new record uh, for that name value processing. So now, It's created that information. So I can go in and actually execute that now. Okay, so if I clear that screen, I can come in and do my document fracturing. Okay, I'll let that run. So once that's actually pulled out, we can see that information come through into our tables. And as you can see, we can go through multiple different of these processes and that it does take a little bit of time to set it up for a particular type of document. But if I've got uh, 15,000 uh, NTSB reports to take two or three hours to set it up to exactly what we actually wanna pull out of that, 
that isn't very much when you're considering pulling 15,000 documents and, and hundreds of millions of records into uh, a structured format and putting some context to it. Okay, so that's done now. So we can actually come into, and I might just use Yellowfin to show the, an end result. So I'll open up Yellowfin. It looks like my server date is, is off, so I'll just update my server date. The 12th, not the 5th. And we'll log back in again. There we go. Of course, uh, we'll have a Yellowfin uh, demonstration in a fortnight. Um, and so if you haven't seen Yellowfin again, it's one of the best products on the market as far as BI. Okay, so I've actually pre created a GIS report uh, off of those two records. Okay, so here we can see my. Uh, uh, in, Hawaii record as well as uh, my Washington DC record. So if I click on one of those, I can see that it's come in. That's my record ID and the time, I actually put the time of the accident in there. So of course, this, these are Google Maps and I can scroll right in to actually see that information. So if I wanted to grab and uh, there it is. right into the actual accident and we can see that information uh, as we need. So if you can imagine 15,000 records drilling in, taking a look at uh, time, uh, the pilot information. So I'm going to actually create a report now directly off of that raw data. Okay, so I'm going to create a report and grab uh, the accident reports. And here I've, I've got some different information. So I want to look at the pilot information, maybe take a look at the age of the, the two records, uh, take a look at uh, some of the pilot hours, maybe the last, again, the 90, 90 days, the 30 days, the 24 uh, hours before. Also, maybe uh, the amount of flight instruction as well as ground instruction information. And uh, I can go ahead and run that information and see that that, that come out. So now I can see that um, uh, the pilot was 43, another one was 56. And we can see the variation in the actual hours before the accident, as well as the total cumulative. So that is quite an, an achievement in uh, the last half an hour to be able to pull that information out very simply and easily. All right. So I might uh, uh, look at some comments, uh, some questions. Um, and. Uh, Ian, have you gotten any questions? Um, no, I haven't actually. So, uh, guys, you, 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 you can if you type the little speech bubble at the top of the screen. Uh, if you've got any questions for Dan uh, on this, uh, then uh, type away. Great. Can we see the star schema? Is one Dan? There you go. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, I'll just uh, show it to you right from. Here, so okay, so I actually pulled in um, uh, aircraft information, location information, and time information from sorry, uh, cities, continents, countries time, time zones, airports, and aircraft information from WAND, and then the demo aircraft, demo uh, location, pilot, and text, and time actually is coming from uh, Bill's um, textual ETL. So here's my quite simple uh, structure for today. Uh, you can see the aircraft incident reports. I'm pulling the information from the aircraft uh, information, combining it with um, uh, the aircraft taxonomy, the location taxonomy, 
for um, latitude and longitude, the airport taxonomy, and um, a time taxonomy as well. So there are many different ta uh, time taxonomies. I just happened to pick the one that was suitable for this particular uh, element. Okay, we've got another question there. Does textual ETL pick mm. up sentiment? Um, the the answer is yes, it does pick up sentiment because you can associate words with um, um with or sentiment. alternate spelling. Yeah. So so if if um, it depends on it depends on you know which language you're looking at and which slang, uh, but you can definitely set that up so that you can pull in sentiments. Um, there are also many taxonomies as well. So Wand has a whole bunch of taxonomies, so it doesn't necessarily have to be built inside of uh, Forest Room because uh, sentiments do change. Um, something cool today is not necessarily cool tomorrow. Uh, the slang does change. So instead of writing that into uh, the textual ETL tool, uh, they're relying on uh, WAND and their taxonomies to be updated um, on a periodic basis. Uh, uh, another question, can you apply textual ETL to system generated logs? Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. You betcha, uh, and that uh, often does happen. So, mm. actually, actually, just going back to the uh, the sentiment uh, question there for a moment. I mean, um, uh, I mean, the answer is absolutely yes because the uh, I mean, one of the the examples that, that Bill gives uh, in his training is the, uh, the you know two guys standing on a street on a warm day and a uh, a lady walks by and one of them says, you know, she looks hot. Um, so, of course, that could mean a whole variety of things depending on the on the context. You know, she's hot because it's a hot day or is it because she's good looking? Um, or, uh, uh, what was that? I can't remember the other one. I think she, maybe she got a parking ticket on her car, so she was hot. I think that's an Americanism. But um, the point being is that, uh, uh, yeah, that's most fair. certainly you can, you can uh, use this for sentiment analysis. But, you know, you, you bear in mind you're dealing with language, and especially with today's younger generation, where something uh, bad or sick means really good. You know, so uh, you've got that challenge to face. Uh, got another question there. Can you tell something about its application in a social data analytics context? And do you have any ready dashboards to show? Uh, short answer is uh, is no. Um, but uh, if that's something that's important, we can probably organise a. Uh, you know, a, a brief POC uh, to do stuff like that. But look, you know, the reason uh, we chose the aircraft, uh, the crash data, which is uh, freely available from the uh, NTSB website, um, is because, you know, that is actually quite a rich set of text. It contains an awful lot of information. Um, and in fact, information, you know, it, it, it's all those very factual. Uh, you know, there's also included in there some, some things like, uh, uh, you know, opinions of various people, like you know, it would have been dangerous to fly that night or whatever. So, so you can get, um, you know, degrees of of, of uh, sentiment and even like social uh, applications for it. So, um, so absolutely, you know, if, if you if if you can gain access to the uh, the social data, if you you know, if you can get a plug into to Facebook or Twitter, and uh, be allowed to pull down huge amounts of data relevant to what you're trying to do, then absolutely, most certainly, you can. Uh, use textual ETL to uh, derive sense of it all. Can textual ETL understand the layout of documents? Well, the bottom line is it, it doesn't really need to. Um, uh, as Dan said before, there's there's repetitive documents um, and, uh, and and the other one. <laughs> I can't remember that, sorry. Um, Non-repetitive. <laughs> non non no, there you go, that's easy. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the answer is... Uh, uh, sort of yes, but it, it doesn't rely on the layout of the document. So it can be just, you know, it, you know what it's like if you cut and paste a uh, a PDF or a HTML report, and then you paste that into a text file, you've lost all your layout, right? But uh, textual ETL can can still, uh, you know, derive meaning. Now, actually, on that subject, um, yeah, Dan, you want to talk about Bill's new product? 
Well, yeah, actually, I, I, I do. Uh, so the previous question was uh, ready dashboards to show. Well, um, uh, Bill is actually putting together some uh, pre-built dashboards for certain industries uh, and certain different types of uh, analytics. So those will, uh, will be prepackaged in uh, certain BI platforms. Okay. The, the, second, the second question there about um, understanding the layout. Now, associated blocks actually gives us uh, the ability to set up different layouts. So if a document does have um, multiple sections to it, such as a web page, let's say, you can set up uh, special characters to pick up the layout of that document. And that's what associated blocks is all about. So it can, but uh, I haven't had an instance yet where I really, really needed to do that, except where I wanted to uh, segregate the information from uh, one type versus a different type. So if they were still both using hours and I had a block uh, section just for pilot versus uh, hours uh, a section for uh, the aircraft, uh, then I would set up associated blocks so that I know that one section that starts and ends in a particular position or, or starts and ends with a particular uh, phrase, uh, then it can actually do that. Uh, so a question coming in, uh, rather than using the GUI, is it possible to handwrite config files uh, use a programming language style syntax? Um, I suppose you probably can uh, because they are all in the control file. So uh, the control file uh, does tell how it's going to need to be processed. So you can modify that control file manually if you really want to. Um, you can also modify um, the database uh, commands. So everything is held inside of uh, the tables inside of the, the Forest Rim database. So you can actually modify the procedures in there if you like. Okay, any other questions? Well, guys, uh, uh, it's uh, just come out to uh, three o'clock, so we, uh, we're bang on time. Is there size explosion? There's another question, so I just want, want to come up there. Um, specifically, what, what aspect of size explosion? I mean, uh, does that, are you, it, you're talking about the size of a report and then the size of the oh okay uh, no not necessarily it doesn't necessarily uh, build a lot of metadata actually there are are um, elements that you can add or remove the different um, uh, metadata records so if I look in here I can actually add in whether or not I can I can start to add in the uh, metadata information. So it doesn't necessarily have to write out that metadata, but um, it, it does. But it it actually isn't that extensive because most.